we're going now uh, in Simon. Yes, sorry. And Simon. And now we're going now with Michael Wan that has got the traditional view on Feng Shui. So let's hear to Simon, I pass to you. So Thank you much. Thank you very much, Gabriella. Um, I'm going to confuse everybody. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> because I like doing it. <laughs> but actually what I'm going to talk about, there is a rational reason why it is. But before I actually start, I, I, all have to, I have to give you all an apology. Firstly, my throat has been bad since I've come back from Australia. My voice just dies after time. Normally on the day before the talk, I practice it so I don't need to use any notes. I hate notes, but I have to because yesterday I couldn't rehearse. That's the first point. The second point, for this talk, I would have ended it at two, 29 minutes 50 seconds. So I can't do it. I really owe you an apology. My point is, when I'm talking to an audience, you have to give them the respect. They are paying me attention. So, but I'm apologizing to you beforehand. And I'm, I'm really sorry. It, I don't think that the talk will be as slick as how I would have liked it. So I'm really sorry. Okay, let's start. I practice what we call traditional feng shui, and we'll start talking about this. I was brought up in Singapore, and Singapore is probably the most feng shui country on earth, or this planet, like the Americans would call it. But the point is, they, did, they started doing it in 1965, when Singapore gained independence from Malaysia and the British where the roads were really changed. Then there was this involvement of a feng shui master, which I'll start talking to you about the infrastructure changes that he did. But I have to explain to you where I come from. I am going to talk about traditional feng shui. And most of you said, yeah, no problem, flying star, this and that. I go to classes, I understand what it's all about. It's very different. What it is was, when the master's looking for students, students come. So it just happened that when I was looking, a master was looking for students. And she wasn't, she doesn't teach. She just looks for a group of people, does the selection through typical Chinese methods, and accumulates a number of students. They then go through the whole process, of training which lasts 10 years and we go I'm going to talk to you about the syllabus that I had and you can see how the whole big picture fits into one the point is feng shui is not an academic subject it is about application to improve the lives of people that's essentially how I treat it I don't look at it as a academic subject I was an academic before I know what the academic is all about. Okay, let's start. Now, for those, for those of you who don't know how feng shui came into the media, this was the story of Hyde Hotel in Singapore in the 1980s. It came out as an article in the Nanyang Xiangbao in Singapore, a Chinese newspaper, where it said that the Hyatt had an occupancy rate of 40%. The Swiss general manager was going to get the boot unless 40 came 90, 80-90%. So what he did was he got the abbot of a, of, of a monastery, Bright Hill in Singapore, and he did some changes. What he did was he tilted the doors towards the junction. I, I won't go into it. You can read it. It's all in the press. But the main point was on the start date, I can't remember. It was the 747, either Fin Air or Pan Am. It broke down in Singapore. 300 people filed into that hotel. From that date onwards, it went to 90%. So this hotel became a legend in Singapore. The Hyatt with the tilted doors. Okay, we won't go into the feng shui of that. There's another reason for it. So in other words, it came into the mainstream. People started knowing 
feng shui was being applied. When I was in Singapore, we heard there is this feng shui guy. But when you ask the secondary question, who is he, what did he do, what was he trained? Nobody knew. So they knew there was this abbot in Bright Hill who did feng shui. Okay, that's the first part. The second part is, this is Singapore by the Singapore River. Okay, now at that time, Singapore River flowed. Now it just goes into the Marina Lake where you see that famous hotel. I can't remember the name now, but that's where you see. But what the point is, sorry? But it's the other side of the bay. But that's not the point. The point is the Singapore River flows. And can you see the expansion of the river? And, it's, and this point here is called the belly of the carp. It is the most prosperous part of Singapore. And the whole part there is really prosperous. It has a lot of energy. All the banks, all the Singapore local banks, have their offices there. Now, unlike the UK, when a bank wants to move, they go to another site. In Singapore, they stay there, they change the doors, and they totally rebuild. The rebuild process can take up to 10 years, but they stay there. That's the first point. So that's the most prosperous part. But in the early 1990s, Singapore wanted to expand. So how do you expand an infrastructure? Any ideas? you build an underground system. Okay? So there are two issues there. The first one is, what does that underground system look like? What does the map look like? Your right hand. Okay? Symbolically. Not exactly, but symbolically. It was changed for a political reason. But the main point is, this was where the energy was. So you're, what they're doing is you're using the underground system to push the energy to the other parts so that energy gets distributed and there will be more prosperous areas. That was the first issue, the design and why. Secondly, there will be disruption. Thirdly, a recession is coming. Now, Singapore people, nobody from Singapore, there's a thing called kiasu, afraid to lose. Now the thing is, when Singa the attitude of Singapore, I can talk because I'm Singaporean. When you're in Singapore, they always talk about, I want more, I want more, afraid to lose. So the attitude, but Singapore was going into a recession. So they had to use a feng shui master, and he came up with a very novel suggestion. Have you heard about the Singapore coin? Huh? Okay, I'll talk to you more about this tomorrow where I'm going to do a site survey, a site inspection and we can talk more about the design of the coin and all that. But the point was, because of the recession and Singapore is a very delicate economy then, people had, uh, could emphasise that there's a feng shui master looking at the recession of the country or trying to help it, but it had the first feng shui coin in the world. Okay, that's Singapore. So, that's the end of Singapore I know. So, what happened was, like any good Singaporean, my parents thought I get a better education here. We won't talk about that, but I came here, I went through school, university, and further education, and fortunately or unfortunately, I had a job my dreams. I worked as a forensic scientist with Scotland Yard. There was a job that I've always wanted, but I was surprised that they offered it to me. But that's another story. But there are a number of things that I learned working as a forensic scientist. One, I learned the skills of investigator. So in other words is, I keep asking questions, relevant or not, but I just look at your face to see what the reaction is. Two, never take anything at face value. So in other words is, if somebody says, I've got the best, I'll ask you to define what the best is. Or well, I'm the greatest. What do you mean by greatest? Okay? Because if they say they are the greatest, for well, me, I could be better. I'm just being facetious, I'm just joking. But the key observation of my interest in Feng Shui was that certain areas were 
had high crime, they got redeveloped, and the crime rate just disappeared. But the same people left there were, were there, so I knew the environment counted. Anyway, that, I'm, I'm running behind time. So when Feng Shui came to the UK, I wanted to look for a trainer, not a teacher, because I've always learned the practical end, but you can't learn Feng Shui on the blackboard. That's my take, so I don't want to go into that. So I was looking for where I could get practical training. And fortunately, somebody alerted me to a teacher in Seattle in Olympia, where we were part of this group, where we went through what I'm going to talk about. And uh, this is what I've come out with. Now, the, the process that I've gone through is the modus operandi of how feng shui was practiced in the Qing dynasty. Qing dynasty is 1642, 24 to 1911, how they worked in teams. Feng shui was not recorded. People, feng shui consultants couldn't read. They learned by rhyming couplets. Okay, so let's do some feng shui. Now, the type of feng shui I'm going to, I'm not going to do the technical end because tomorrow we're going to, I'm planning to do a site inspection of very large development, which is successful, and it had been designed from, Feng Shui had been designed from scratch. So we're going there to explain exactly what happens. So I'm leaving the technical out, but I'm just going to talk to you about some buildings in the London which had had Feng Shui done from scratch. Oh, sorry, this is the syllabus. The syllabus, all of us had to go through this syllabus, whether we liked it or not. But the main point was, we did it, whether you liked it or not. Okay, so the first part is philosophical art, we didn't do any of that. But then, because we're working a team, and we could go in the middle of the Brazilian forest, we had to learn acupuncture to help ourselves. Then we did divination, Shanxi, where it was Dai Yi, Men, and Dalu Ren. This is what you've been talking about, and I'll go through these processes. But the difference between your at high level, mine is a very basic level because my mind is very simple. Then, destiny analysis, Ba Zi, and Zi Wei. Anybody here does Zi Wei? Okay, it's very different. Okay, then appearance. This is my my forte, Feng Shui. We do face reading, not because we want to do face reading, but because we have to negotiate with the client. The client gives away the face reading. That's essentially why we do it. That's why I enjoy just asking stupid questions and looking at people's faces. Just to provoke, but now you know my modus operandi. Okay, let's do some Feng Shui. That's all you come for. It's a Feng Shui society. Where is promoting the higher standards? So this is a design from scratch of Camelot, which is the uh, lottery operator in this country. It is so simple that nobody would think it's feng shui. L-shaped building facing northeast. Anybody know why northeast? This is a period energy. This is the most prosperous energy at this time. And if you look at the landscape, you get the energy flowing there. Right? For the American friends, if I use the word Costco, they would know and they would smile because every time they go there, they get fed. Yes. Did you know it had been feng shui? Now you know. All, this, all the Costco shops have a similar layout based on one design by a feng shui master. And if you look very carefully at the land, you get energy flowing that way, and the entrance is there. Okay, now you've got homework. Right, this is in Hammersmith. <clears throat> I had a job nearby, then it clicked. There's a, sh a place called Skybet. Most of you know the betting, sh betting area? It's there. Right, it's there. Okay, now you know rivers, water carries energy. Okay, we all understand that. So when you have a straight river, the energy just flows down with the straight river. But when it bends, 
energy gets distributed there. So can you see the sky bed there? Sky bed office, can you see? It's bigger that end than this end. Can you all see that? In other words, is it just an arm? I'm inviting you. Simple. That's my level of feng shui. You can charge a lot of money for that. Okay. Has anybody, can anybody recognize this building from the air? Americans wouldn't. Only Londoners would know. Nobody? Okay. It's this one. Okay. It's a woman's shop, or it was a woman's shop. Um, Marks and Spencer's headquarters. They had very good building in Baker Street. They had very good feng shui, plenty of energy going through. Now they're relocated at Paddington Lock, and that's a dead end water, so energy goes down there. Not, not active. Right? So, in other words, what I'm saying is, in this square, hardly any energy goes there. At the back, which is St. Mary's Hospital at the back, that water, that canal water is dead. Okay? So if you look at this building, that's the building. Have, does anybody notice anything about how it's split into two? The left side is bigger than the right. What does the left side mean? Dragon? Dragon? Tiger? Tiger? Can you see that? One look at this building, I knew that it's woman's business. It's not going to be as good as it was before. Can you see how simple the signs are to make an interpretation? I mean, I can, I, there are two things. Just by looking at this building, or three things. One, the company is divided internally. Two, the women's business won't be as, it's not as prosperous as it was. You just look at the market share. Thirdly, they're in a place where there's hardly any energy. Do you think they will be doing well? Just look at the figures. Right, another one. This is in Houston. Has anybody heard of Abbey National? They had very good offices in, I think, 221 Baker Street, just by Hyde Park, plenty of energy. They bought up the whole area of Houston. Okay, there's hardly any energy there because all the energy goes to the east. Anyway, we won't talk about how the energy flows. Okay, that's the entrance. If you saw that, what do you think that is? It's on stilts. What does, you're talking feng shui symbolism. I, I interpret it as a coffin. Okay? Two things. One, a man committed suicide there because he was um, being investigated for some fiddles and Abbey National had, was being investigated because they weren't doing well and a lot of paper was being shifted here and there. But secondly, got taken over by Santander. It was doing very badly. So the, the headquarters has now moved to Milton Keynes. But just by looking at these buildings in a very simplistic way, energy analysis, looking at the entrance, you can, you can make a conclusion of how to do it. But far more importantly is how do you create it? That's how we do it. Finally, this was Britain, British, the largest British company, but now no longer. Our American friends would know when I say the word clear water horizon. Do you know what that means? Everybody else? This is the location of BP. BP took over a very swanky building in St. James's Square. Okay? Before that, it was not Nokia, the other one, Ericsson. You know what happened to Ericsson and the mobile phones? They had to divest and join JV with uh, Sony, and now they're out of the mobile phone. In other words, is whoever had the, the building had previously had a succession of failure. So BP took over this building. Oops. That the building is here. The energy comes down there and it just goes straight down to Piccadilly. In other words, this building does not get any energy. As soon as they moved there in about 2010, we had that big explosion, 
in the Bay of Mexico. There were a lot of fishermen who were very unhappy with BP. That's the office. And the energy just got passes down that road straight to Piccadilly. OK, that's the feng shui that I do. The other part now is timing systems. To me, it's very important. I'm going to overrun, I'm sorry. OK, so Sanxi is the pinnacle of timing systems. And there are three. The, the, OK, the significance, these are the most important timing, uh, timing systems. If you can do that, you are a seriously good astrologer. If you're doing Pazi, but if you're doing these three, I respect you. Tai, in Chinese systems, there's always a trilogy or a trinity. Heaven, earth, man. So Tai, it's about heaven. This system is about the government. I will not be taught this, because it's too, too touchy for me. This, I'll give you an example of its usage. President Bush was in the watch when New Orleans happened. OK, this system is actually very good. What, what this system does, it tells you theoretically when there'll be an earthquake, its severity, if there's a flood, how long, when, how deep, and how many people will suffer. It was very good for floods because the Chinese emperors knew the mandate of heaven would be terminated if too many people were, ki were killed by floods. So Bush had a very severe reprimand, is that the right word? Telling off about how he treated the, the New Orleans floods. We just leave it there, we don't have to go in. OK, so the White House started asking serious questions in the Mississippi floods. OK, so he was told that would be the this would not be the limit. It would not go further than that. And that's why he got away with it. Had it been worse, I mean, the prediction was that he listened, that he did not need to do anything more. But again, there would be the reaction, but he knew what the limit of the, the system was. Then there's Qi Men Dun Jia. It's about earth energies. It has eight directions, and how you use it in a timing se sequence, which I'll talk about. The other one is Da Liu Ren. Da Liu Ren is about divination. I have never seen a divination system so accurate. It tells you who are the people who might backstab you. It is in three tiers, start, middle, finish. In other words, I look at the end, is it worthwhile doing it? That's all I do. But anyway, we'll go on. So I'm going to overrun, I'm sorry. OK, Chi Men, what's so special about it? It is the only divination system which has direction and time. No other system can do that throughout the world. It is totally unique. It's also very flexible. But there are limitations. OK, we have the eight doors. I won't go through it. I'm sure all of you have gone through that before. In other words, is you've got eight doors for good, for bad, or in various ways. And they are in the Bakwa sequence, which all of you should know. OK? So in other words, is for that time, if you go in that direction of northwest, Kai, you get entry or prosperity of Sun. As simple as that. It's just getting the right times to do it. That's my level of of how I do it. But the key point is that it has to be validated. I live in a world where, where people tell me something. Yeah, you're so right. OK, there are three levels of it, year, month, and day. And that's how you can operate. But the, most people do it for the day. I also do it for the month because I've got the necessary books. But the key part of this is verification for me. I'm a right bastard. So what I'll do is sometimes, you have the Chi Men book ahead. You look at that. What I developed was I've got a route from the car. You know that the, the fact is if you drive in the a Sun Chi direction for 10, 15 minutes, you pick up the relevant energy, and then you can see the effect. So this bastard takes the book. He looks at the characteristics of this energy. He takes his car. It's roughly 10 miles, six traffic lights, 
Three are pedestrian, two roundabouts. So I go, I record how many stops, how many interference I get. So I actually understand the combinations of the meanings. When, when the teacher says that, oh, I've got to try it out. So in other words, is because I've tried it, I felt it. When you feel it, you understand it. And that is what I feel in functional education people don't have. You need to feel it to get it through. This is my take. OK, that, these are the charts that I use. One day, 12 charts. We won't go in. I've taken too much time. Essentially, you can see. Ah, never mind. We, 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 you all have got, got, gone through that. OK, applications. Debt collection. When do I hit my, the person who owes me money lives in the Northwest? When is it a good time to collect the money? Diagnosis or illness, it tells you which part of the body, serious or not, whether you get married, baby gender, exam, lawsuit, travel thief, game result. That's the part that I really enjoyed. You can watch a football game and then you can tell um, which side is going to win. How about men? Enjoy that. Okay. Lottery winning, like hell. The simple reason is you can't win big because there's another factor that controls your winning, how big your winnings are. Anybody know what it is? Sorry? Butter. Well, we, we, we tried it. When are we going to get the And of course the master say, oh yeah, go on try it. <laughs> okay, butter reading is only very superficial. Feng Shui reading is about ego telling you what, what direction your, the, the person's house is. It's all from the charts, the biggest tree and things like that. I don't waste my time. When will it happen? Auspicious start time. That is far better than, uh, I don't know what timing systems you use because it tells you the direction, the purpose, and you know what type of response you get. Am I right? So we're getting co collaboration. Ren, this, in my opinion, is the best divination system. I, c I can't remember the name, it's about six something, I can't remember, but it doesn't matter. We call it DLR. Okay, it's a very accurate system with unsurpassed accuracy. Charts are like that. It's a pain in the air. It's taken me three years just how to read the chart. Okay, I get distracted very easily, but that's why it's three years. But the main point is that. That's one of the charts, a yin and yang chart, depending on the time, things like that. But this is where Ba Zhu comes from. At the moment, I, I don't want to point out to you where the eight characters are, but we'll just leave it there. This is where Ba Zhu comes from this. And I had a read, we did a reading on myself about that. <laughs> and you're getting, the difference between Daliren and Four Pillars is just like watching TV on black and white 405 lines. And Daliren is seen on HD, 4K, and you can see the finer detail to what extent the event is going to happen. Because Four Pillars is quite general, in my opinion. When, once you go back to, once you start doing it 4K TV, you know what real TV watching is like. But when you see, and you go back to 405 lines, black and white, you don't want to watch it. So it's really worthwhile trying this. Right. It gives you the full story, versatility and accuracy. What it is, is you ask a question, is it a good day? No, well, coming to the Feng Shui Society conference on June the 10th, would it be a good and beneficial event for me. For example, or Pamela has suggested that I go to the States to see President, what's his name now? Trump. You see, I can ask a project and then you get back the reply beginning. What the, probably the first part would be, why would you want to see President Trump? He's unavailable, he's too busy. That sort of thing, but it goes through a project. The main point to me is will it succeed? And it tells you the chances. It doesn't tell you in percentage, but the typical Chinese way, you can work out. 
roughly whether it's worthwhile. So in conclusion, I'm, this is, I'm giving you an example of traditional feng shui projects that has happened in the UK. There are quite a few. I mean, there are quite a few more. I, I won't talk about it. But that is the group that I'm working with that has done these type projects. So I've come to the society to talk about myself and my passion. Now, tomorrow there's a site visit where we're going to see Canary Wharf, which 300,000 people work in. And also, it was designed with feng shui from scratch. So by visiting this, you understand exactly how feng shui was done. No low pans were used in this project. Current work, I do work in small, large projects, from single residencies audits to designs of cities. And if you want to know more information about me, it's michaeloon.com. I have finished six minutes late, I'm sorry. Okay. Any questions? What's the difference between traditional and classical feng shui? I have no idea. I don't know anything about classical feng shui. Yes, but I have a question. Uh, first, you started with, with the story of the Hyatt building, which is a very dear story to me. Uh, and my observation oh, is... Who, 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 could I... Your, your name is? My name is Juan. Juan. Oh, okay. Juan. Yep. Yeah, sorry. It's a, it's a complicated name, not Portuguese. Though the concept of the tilting doors is a very difficult concept to get onto the rest of the line. And sometimes when you re recommend it to a client, he doesn't really understand it. But it's very, very strong too. And I'm going to ask you, could, could you quote us the Feng Shui master that did the highest? Hong Chuan. Hong Chuan. You, you, you learned under Li Yao. He, he does uh, Hong Chuan. Yes, right. And his, his master was Yen Pen. And his, the, Yen Pen, the master of Yen Pen was Dan Yang Wu's, which is a very strong lineage for for Shuan Kong. Mm -hmm. Are you giving, are you letting me off light? <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to me and I do apologize. I could have done better by finishing on time and probably made it more interesting. Okay.